Dear audience, let me present my PhD research about extraintestinal manifestations in inflammatory bowel disease. My name is Agnes Timmer. I'm a PhD student and a pediatric resident at Hempa National Pediatric Institute. I have a vision to improve the quality of life of IBD patients through proper treatment. And to achieve that, my mission is to assess long-term disease outcomes and treatment options of IBD patients with extraintestinal manifestations. As you can see here, I have two ongoing projects. Both of them are focusing on extraintestinal manifestations. In the first one, we assess the frequency of extraintestinal manifestations during different advanced therapies, conducting a meta-analysis. So let's start with its importance. Anti-TNFs have been known to be effective in, in uh, IBD and revolutionized its management. However, one-third of the patients experience loss of response within three years, and in these cases, new therapeutic agents are available. However, there is a, group, a vulnerable group of patients, approximately 10 to 25 percent of them, who will develop extraintestinal manifestations. These patients face a greater challenge in their daily living due to greater symptom burden, higher peer burden, and impaired quality of life. And there is a frequent misconception that the successful treatment of the intestinal inflammation will be always sufficient to treat these extraintestinal manifestations as well. Therefore, it is highly important to adapt the treatment to cover extraintestinal manifestations too. In this slide, I would like to highlight our treatment options very briefly. We have ustekinumab, tofacitinib, and upracitinib, which all have a systematic effect and are already applied in other immune-mediated diseases. And on the contrary, there is vedolizumab, which is a gut-selective drug. Therefore, it is expected to have less effect on extraintestinal manifestations. Therefore, our aim was to determine which of these drugs is associated with the lowest frequency of new extraintestinal manifestations. So we investigated IBD patients who received uh, advanced therapy, and their primary outcome was new extraintestinal manifestations, and the secondary ones improvement and worsening of pre-existing extraintestinal manifestations. We hypothesized that the, <coughs> the prevalence of extraintestinal manifestations will be highest in patients who are on gut selective biologicals. We conducted our systematic search in four databases, which resulted in more than 13,000 hits. And during the selection process, we were able to reduce it to 61 eligible articles. Let's proceed with the results. Uh, this plot shows the proportion of new extraintestinal manifestations during advanced therapy when they are all pulled together. And as I mentioned, we hypothesized that the proportion will be higher in uh, the vedolizumab subgroup. And indeed, we found a higher uh, prevalence rate. However, the difference did not reach statistical significance. And as extraintestinal manifestations are really distinct diseases, we decided to analyze them separately as well. So this plot shows full proportions of new joints, skin, and ocular manifestations. Here we can see that the prevalence rates of extraintestinal manifestations are low, and there was no significant difference in case of uh, any of the groups. <clears throat> However, moving forward to our secondary uh, outcomes, we also investigated proportion in the change of pre-existing uh, <clears throat> extraintestinal manifestations, in this case joint involvement, so these two plots show improvement and worsening rates. And we can see that uh, improvement rates are significantly lower in the vedolizumab subgroup, <clears throat> whereas worsening rates are significantly higher in the vedolizumab subgroup compared to the ustekinumab uh, treated patients. Uh, our study has several strengths, uh, such as we were able to include a relatively high number of studies, and uh, which were mostly published uh, in the <coughs> last five years. And uh, we provided the detailed subgroup analysis and the meticulous methodology. However, there are several limitations as well. For example, there were no RCTs available in this topic, and we had to deal with heterogeneous follow-up times and <coughs> sometimes non-standardized reporting system in, uh, in uh, in the different articles for extraintestinal manifestations. So, uh, to conclude, uh, new extraintestinal manifestations during advanced therapy seem to be rare, and there was only a significant difference in case of worsening <coughs> and uh, improvement rates uh, uh, where joint involvement was present. So, we suggest not to under-prioritize vedolizumab in cases of pre-existing extraintestinal manifestations except where a joint involvement is present.
And for the research side, we suggest to come up with a more standardized reporting system, and there is a, a strong need for prospective registries with detailed information about extraintestinal manifestations and these advanced therapies. And I'm really glad to say that uh, our article was accepted and published uh, in this month in the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis, which is a D1 journal. <clears throat> so I mentioned my, uh, my second project is also focusing on extraintestinal manifestation. Here we are investigating the asso association of extraintestinal manifestations and the intestinal disease severity in uh, children with IBD. So extraintestinal manifestations are frequent in the pediatric uh, IBD population as well. At least 25-40% of them will develop at least one during their lifetime. However, little is known whether these patients experience more severe intestinal disease course. We found a recent meta-analysis which showed that these patients who have extraintestinal manifestations have a higher risk of undergoing IBD-related surgery and receiving biological therapy. Uh, this meta-analysis included articles mostly with the dots, so we are uh, interested whether the situation is the same with GRM. And there are already some suggestions in the literature that early aggressive therapy could prevent uh, long-term complications. So our aim is to provide a descriptive analysis of the frequency of extraintestinal manifestations in the Hungarian pediatric IBD patients based on the uh, HUPIA registry and to analyze the association between the presence of extraintestinal manifestations and the intestinal disease scores. For that, uh, we are investigating pediatric IBD patients and we will compare those who have an extraintestinal manifestation at the time of diagnosis and compare with those who have no extraintestinal manifestations <coughs> during their follow-up. And our outcomes will be relapse rates, need for biological treatment, surgeries, and steroid dependence. We hypothesize that patients uh, with extraintestinal manifestation have a higher risk of poor prognosis of IBD. And we plan to define the role of extraintestinal manifestation as a prognostic factor so that our patient could prevent from earlier treatment escalation. So we are working from the Hungarian Pediatric IBD Registry and we included IBD patients diagnosed between 2010 and 20 who had at least a two-year follow-up time. So here are our descriptive results. We were able to include uh, 938 Crohn's disease patients and 531 patients with ulcerative colitis. Uh, as you can see, there was no significant difference in case of age or uh, gender between the two groups. <coughs> so moving forward, we used Kaplan-Meier curves to uh, demonstrate our data. This uh, shows biological free survival. And we can see that in case of Crohn's disease patients, uh, those who had an extraintestinal manifestation and diagnosis uh, received biological treatment significantly earlier than those who, who had no extraintestinal manifestations. We see a, a same tendency in case of ulcerative colitis patients, although we cannot say that uh, it is significant because uh, the statistics does not show them. Mm, moving to uh, relapse free survival, here we can see that there was uh, no difference between the, uh, between the two groups. Mm, neither in uh, Crohn's disease patients nor in ulcerative colitis patients. Uh, to have more accurate data, we are also building a COX regression <laughs> model, and we plan to uh, include these listed variables, the um, extent of manifestation presents, the age, uh, gender, family history, and the disease localization as well. So we received most of the uh, data, and I've already started to write the article. <clears throat> to summarize, uh, my first study was published this month, and I plan to submit uh, the second one this spring. And I would like to thank you for your attention with the quote that the best preparation for tomorrow is doing your best today. My question is regarding your second project. You mentioned that you included patients with at least two year follow-up, but what was the mean follow-up time? Yes, the <coughs> average follow-up time uh, in this registry is approximately uh, 2.6 uh, years. It's, uh, it's 
seems to be a, a short follow-up time, but uh, it's not because the dropout rates are so high, but these patients are usually diagnosed in their adolescent year, so they uh, go from this registry to the adult gastroenterology care. You said that it's in progress, okay, we understand it, but uh, maybe, what do you think, what will be the most important uh, extraintestinal manifestation, why patients have more biological in Crohn? Mm. You mean what type of... So you said that basically if somebody have uh, more extraintestinal manifestation at the beginning, yes. have higher chance in Crohn to start biological early. But uh, which extraintestinal manifestation is a, a risk factor or maybe in this model uh, significant? Yeah. We, we are thinking about a joint manifestation. Joint. Yes. Right. Yes, joint manifestations, and uh, we plan to look at it particularly uh, in case of arthritis or arthralgia that uh, maybe... So you will visit. do some analysis also? Yes. Okay, great. And, uh, okay, you said about skin, eye, and joint. What about the most uh, interesting uh, extraintestinal manifestation, which is also sometimes a complication of the disease or the medication, hepatitis, pancreatitis, and so on? What do you think about? Uh, so, in, in this article, we did not consider pancreatitis as an extraintestinal manifestation because we followed the uh, ECHO guideline, and based on that, it was not listed as an, uh, an extraintestinal manifestation. Uh, so, we were just dealing with uh, sclerotizing cholangitis as in case of liver manifestations. But, mm, there we could see no, no difference between the treatments, so vadolism seemed to be as good as the others. I would like to ask about your second project, and as we know that the younger age of the patients is associated with war prognosis, are you going to do some subgroups according to age? Um, yes, I think it, since it will be in the Cox regression model a variable, the age, then it, it will be analyzed as a, as a factor. But thank you for Thanks. your question.